Uh, Harold wore his flag shirt today. He knew he was gonna <laughs> knew he was gonna win the fireworks. Hallelujah. <laughs> so everybody's invited to Harold's for fireworks and <laughs> praise God. That's cool. Happy Fourth of July. Turn to somebody and just tell them happy freedom to you. Glory to God. I tell you what, if you've, if you've ever been outside the United States for any reason, you appreciate the freedom we have. If you don't, come here, I'll, I'll lay hands on you and we'll pray for you, amen, or something. Praise God. What a blessing it is to live in a free nation. I know we're, we got our problems just like, you know, I mean, you find more than half a person and you got problems. How many of you have sometimes more problems with you than you do other people? Yeah, oh, come on, now don't give me the holy ad thing here. We are human, aren't we? If you don't believe you are, just pinch yourself, and you'll see the flesh is still there, amen? But thank God the Lord is our salvation. He's not all pushed out of shape just because we're human, amen? And uh, he's helped us. Just stand with me one more time, and let's, let's pray this morning. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just make a dec- I don't know why this is on me so strong this morning. Just make a decision to clear your heart today. And when I, when I, say, when I say that, what I mean is this. is, You know, in Ephesians 1, is my microphone on? Oh, okay. Uh, in Ephesians 1, Paul said about the Ephesus church, he says, When I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love to all the saints, I started praying this for you. And if you read the prayer he prayed, he started praying for them to come into revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation would come to them that they could grow and mature in their understanding of really what did happen at the cross and in heaven when Jesus was seated as, as our great king and high priest. And, you know, you can, you can clutter your, your heart up with things. You know, we're, we're told in the scripture that unforgiveness is like cancer. It'll eat you up. Unforgiveness and anger, it has to be dealt with. If not, it'll turn into bitterness. And when it turns into bitterness, it becomes a root. And if you've ever pulled something with a, uh, you know, a strong root out, it's a lot harder to get it out than when it's in seed form, right? That's why he says, deal with it while it's anger. Deal with it while it's, you know, this unforgiveness. Because those things will grow up in you, and that pride that you'll live in will actually blind you. It'll blind you from receiving from God, even though God loves you. He can't clear your own heart for you. And I, I don't care if you've been born again 50 years. You can still have things that keep you from receiving. That's why Paul says, when I heard of your faith in Jesus and that you're walking in love with people, I started praying this for you because you're going to be able to get this now. Amen. Now, I'm not throwing stones at you or judging you this morning. I'm just saying, be honest with your own heart. One thing I found about it is I don't have to dig up bones. If there's something there, the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, Father, we want a clear heart this morning. We're not saying we don't have that. We're just coming before you. And I pray if there's even one person under the sound of my voice, if it's me, Lord, whoever it is, whatever it is, if there's something we need to deal with in order to be able to hear what you have to say and see what you're revealing, and understand it in our heart, because we know that you told your disciples that you taught the multitudes in parables because uh, they weren't going to see it anyway because they hadn't done what we're talking about. So, Lord, we want to be able to see. We don't want to live in presumption or assumption. We don't want to walk in false pride, which is a false lie. It's a darkness when it looks like a light. We want to hear from you today. We want to be like Mary. We've already mentioned her. We want to receive that part that cannot be taken from us. So we come to you right now. We humble ourselves. Lord, if there's anything, anyone we need to forgive, anything we need to let go of, we choose because we know forgiveness is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's a decision, a decision of the heart. And so we choose, Lord. Lord, if, if there are people here that need to forgive themselves, I pray that you'll help them to do that this morning. Help them to see that your love, your blood, your mercy, your grace, your goodness is so much greater than our human frailties and failures. Everybody in this room has missed it enough to, to hold themselves in unforgiveness, but that doesn't please you because you love us and you're taking us into the image of Christ. 
So we thank you for that this morning, Lord. May the deck be cleared. May there not be anything that would hinder your people from receiving and hearing your voice, what your spirit would say to them today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, once again, just tell somebody, uh, tell them something. Tell them hi. <laughs> tell them you love them. Tell them something. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Love you. Love you, brother. Hey, I appreciate it. Amen. Love you. Hey, Bless you. I had a picture in worship of a bird sitting in a cage, and the Lord came over and opened the, the gate, mm -hmm. but the bird was Praise God. Amen. She was just sharing with me that uh, during worship, she saw the Lord showed her a, a bird in a cage and how that the Lord opened the door of the cage, was reaching his hand in, but the bird was so used to the confines of the cage, he kept backing away. Maybe that's why we just prayed what we just prayed. Amen. God wants you free. Yeah. And one of the devil's greatest tricks is condemnation and guilt and shame. Those are his, his tricks against you. He points out that you're a human. Wow. I am. So what? What does that have to do with anything? Amen? Praise God. The blood of Jesus purges sin. When we confess our sins, he's faithful, which means he does it every time. He's just. You want justice? Here's justice. What the blood did for you is enough. And I don't care how many times the devil blames you, blames you, blames you, blames you, or accuses God or accuses God. The just blood of Jesus cleanses your sins. It purges your sins. It doesn't cover them so they can be brought up again someday in the, in the future. They are purged. They don't exist anymore. And so receive your freedom. Receive your forgiveness. Receive it. Amen. You know, the Bible says we're to be part of the beloved. You know what that means? That means you need to be loved. You need to let him love you. 1 Corinthians 13 says mature or perfected love flushes out fear. And we always look at that, or I always had in years previous, that I need to love God more. Well, we do need to love God with all of our heart. See, it got quiet right now because we interpret that as being a perfect person, and that's not what he's talking about. Anybody that you love, you know, your spouse or your children or someone you love with all your heart, has your relationship with them been perfect? Have you always said the right thing to them or done the right thing concerning them? Of course not. But it's not about that. It's about your heart. Amen? And so perfected love is understanding, getting a revelation of how much he loves you and that his love's greater than any attack of the devil against your life or any mistake you've ever made or any sin you've ever committed. I like what my wife says. A mistake is when you're walking along and you trip and you fall in a mud puddle. Sin is when you walk up, you look at the mud puddle, and you know your mama told you to stay out of those mud puddles. But you jump in anyway. People today, you know, the, the word sin has kind of become something we don't talk about. But sin is still sin. And when I sin, I admit it. Amen. That's the only way to get rid of it. Well, don't take that off my preaching time, amen? <laughs> Praise God. But sometimes, you know, we've got to get things cleared up before we can really step into what God has for us. Grab your Bible if you have it or your uh, electronic device, whatever you might have this morning. Turn over to Luke chapter 4. The Lord just seems uh, recently, he just seems to keep bringing me over to this chapter and having me speak out of this chapter. Now, the Lord told me many years ago, he said, because I was, when I was first in ministry, I had this mentality that I had to have some new heavy revy from heaven every week. <laughs> something hot off the press. Well, God does want to give us something that's relevant and something that's, you know, hot off the press from that perspective. 
but he, he doesn't want us to necessarily have to have something we haven't ever heard before every week. You know why? Because sometimes it takes us a long time to get what we've already heard. And he told me years ago, he said, sometimes I have you saying over and over and over and over. And I said, why? He says, because I want you to preach it until you and the people get it. Once you get it, once it's not just some idea in your mind, but it actually becomes revelation to you where it's a sin. How do you know it's revelation to you? It's in you and you live it. Come on. It's like people say, well, you know, you talk to people about Jesus. Oh, I know. I believe in God. Well, are you living for him? Well, no. Well, then, no, you don't believe in God. Because the word believe means that you're living by it. Not you're mentally assenting to it. Amen? I believe there are mass murderers. But I don't, I'm not living that. How many of you are glad of that? Your pastor's not a mass murderer? Glory to God. Amen? <laughs> I'm sorry, sometimes my, uh, my analogies aren't like, you know, they're just kind of. But see, I, I know, I, I, I mainly assent to the fact that there are mass murderers in the world. But that doesn't mean I believe that. I'm believing that for me, that I'm living that. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, you get me in, get me out of it. Amen. So he told me that I'm going to be teaching and preaching sometimes some things over and over and over. Because sometimes just because we understand a few principles about what's being taught or, or shared or spoken to us, we think we've got it, but we don't really have it. And that's why I was praying earlier like I was praying, because I've come to understand that we've got to get these things in us in a way that they're, they're seen from his perspective, not ours. The Bible says, the prophet said of God, he says, I will guide you with my eye. That doesn't just mean that he will look out in the future and he's, okay, well, here's what they need to do and I need to provide this and prepare that. He does that. But he also gives us eyes to see and ears that hear what the Spirit is revealing and saying to the church. The only way I'm going to see clearly is to see through his eyes. To have the mind of Christ that talks about in 1 Corinthians 2, to discern or understand it the way he discerns or understands it. And that's why it's so wonderful to know that the Holy Spirit lives in you because he can take you to that place. Right. Amen? Amen? Don't ever quit being teachable. Because if you do, you're in pride. You've got yourself fooled. If, if you look exactly, if you're the express total image of Jesus, of who he is and how he is, well, maybe then you can think about not learning. But even then, I think you're going to learn some things. But stay teachable. Stay humble. Keep growing. The disciples thought that, you know, they'd hung with Jesus for a few years. They'd seen him operate a little bit. They'd seen the miracles. They'd seen this. They'd seen that. And they started kind of bucking for position because they knew he's going to set up this kingdom one of these days. And I want to be on the inner circle. I want to be the guy standing next to him right there in the throne. You know, they're, they're doing the power play thing that humans want to do to be, you know, even, who, who was it, John and uh, the Sons of Thunder? Who's the other one? James and John. Was it James and John? They got their mama to talk to Jesus for. I figure he won't listen to me. I'll get mama over here. Mama knows how to get this done. And she, she interceded for them. Can my two sons, be? and Jesus said, that's not for me to even decide. My father chooses that. And then he went over and got a little child probably got the one that was creating the most havoc and noise in the meeting. <laughs> Brought him over or her over, whatever it was, uh, and said, you want to be great in the king? You want position? You want authority? You want to you know, move into that, what you're talking about? Got to be like this. You got to stay humble. You got to stay like a little child. Now, there are things, of course, that we need to mature in, and God expects us to stand up. You know, he told people that Stand up and talk to me like a man. But at the same time, there's always that element of us being like a little child and our father teaching us. Yes. Amen. Did you find Luke 4 yet? So the Lord, just he's led me here again today, and we're just going to go with this. 
and see where he takes us. This, of course, is where Jesus had just been baptized in water. He had come to a point where he was um, prepared. That's another aspect of what we are just talking about. If Jesus had to be prepared to step into the fullness of what the Father had called him to do, who are we to think we don't have to be? You see, people, one of the things that, I've been pastoring now over 30 years, and I've, I've, you know, went through a lot of situations with a lot of people, and the ones that <clears throat> refuse a lot to do like what we were just talking about, those are the ones, I've had people be in this church almost 20 years and never change. Never change. I've, I, some of them, hours and hours and hours of what we would call counseling or advise, advising, talking to them, never change. And there's one common denominator I begin to see. You know, you just learn some things by just being there for a while, you know. There's one common denominator I begin to see was that that person had bitterness in them. Now, that, that plant of bitterness, that root of bitterness, produces something out in the natural realm. Uh, usually, one of the big key factors is self-pity. Poor me. Poor me. Everybody's picking on me. Everybody's treating me bad. Everybody owes me an apology. And when you would talk to them about their uh, culpability or their responsibility in the matter, never once was there an admission that they had any responsibility. Yeah, I've been there too, brother. I lived that way for 16 years. <laughs> Self-pity is one of the most dangerous things you'll ever enter into in your life. Did you know it's not about you? Now, with God, it's all about you. He loves you. Man, he's going to give you everything he's got for you. He'll give you the, he's going to give you the whole kingdom. You ever join there with Jesus? But if you live a life of what are people doing to me, what about me, you're deceived, and the devil is going to dominate your thinking, and, and the truth can, will come and slap you in the face, but it'll bounce off of you like a rubber ball off of the wall. This is not my message, Lord. You know that, don't you? <laughs> At least I didn't think it was. But see, you have to get out of that. And I've watched people run in that circle, run in that circle for almost 20 years, and finally, they get miserable being around people that keep talking to him about dealing with that. And so the next step is leave the church and blame the pastor right. or the people in the church. Nobody walks in love in that church. You were the most guilty one of not walking in love. If you left the church and you're pointing your finger at the pastor or at people in the church, you are the guilty party, not them. Now, I'm not saying they didn't do things right. They may have done some things wrong. The pastor may have even done some things wrong. But it's never, when has it ever been about that? When did you ever see Jesus demanding an apology? Oh, you owe me an apology. No, I don't. I owe you forgiveness. If you call somebody up and say, you owe me an apology, you're already off on the wrong foot. The Bible says if your brother offends you, go to him with the purpose of making peace between you. Not putting them in their place. Because you don't even know your place if you've got that attitude. How are you going to put them in their place when you don't even know where yours is at? Dear Lord, the Lord's getting me in trouble this morning. Isn't he? No, he's getting us out of trouble is what he's doing. Now, see, these are things that we all have to watch and guard in our life. The enemy's looking for a way in. He's not going to show up like Hollywood portrays him. You know, he's, or how, you know the old thing with the, the horns and the, the fork tail and the pitchfork. He's not going to walk into your room one day and go, Hi, I'm the devil. Are you ready to get cursed? Let me deceive you. What he's going to do is he's going to look like a snake looking for a crack in the wall. 
He's, he's looking for, how, I need them to give me access to their heart. What is it that God can't bless and that causes God to have to stand back and let me do what I want to do? Number one, unforgiveness. Jesus said in the last days that one of the number one characteristics of the, that you would know you're in the last of the last days is that many would be offended and betray one another. Oh, my God. You walk down the street and look at somebody wrong, and they're ready to beat you up. You don't get their hamburger fast enough, and they're ready to climb the counter on you. Of course, we've taught people that for 40-plus years. It's all about you. The world centers around you. And so when you don't treat me the way I think I ought to be treated, I have the right to go home and get a gun and kill you. It's called narcissism. It's a selfish, demonic mindset that causes you to be God. And guess what? You ain't got the ability to be God. You can't carry the load God carries. You don't have the wisdom God has. It ain't nothing but a setup for you to crash hard one day. But see, this, is, this business of everybody owes me something. No, 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 no. You owe God everything. And you owe your brother the love and the prayers and the support. And your sister. Now, there again, that doesn't mean we don't work things out. But we have to have the right heart in doing that. You know what most people do? They come to the pastor and, and tattle on somebody. And I don't, nine times out of ten, I say, you know what the Bible says? If your brother or sister offends you, you go to them, not tattle on the, to the pastor. But see, they don't want to go and say, look, I want us to have peace between us. And if I've offended you, whether I've, you know, Knowingly or unknowingly, I'm sorry about that, but I want us to work this out to where we're walking in love with one another and walking in peace. Until we learn to do that in the church, the glory of God is never going to manifest at the level in the church that it needs to. I could prove that to you if I had time. Psalm 133, you can read it when you get home. It says that when the the brethren dwell together in unity... That doesn't mean we all believe the same doctrine. What that means is that we have the same heart one for another, and that is a heart of love. Amen. Selfless love. When I say love, I'm talking agape. Selfless love. It ain't about me. It's about you. The Bible even tells us to consider our brother higher than us. Amen. 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 Man. Something like that. That's what happens when you try to say two words at one time. That's when, in that environment, see, because God is what? Agape. And if you're going to get anything done, God has to show up. What we call the glory is just God. So when we create an environment that God can show up, he shows up. If I've got a spiritual environment in my heart and in my mind that's not conducive to him showing up, He's not going to show up. You know why? He loves me too much. Wait a minute, Pastor. He's not going to show up because he loves you too much? I thought him showing up would help you. No, it would kill me. Well, I don't get that. I didn't either for a long time. Adam and Eve, the Bible says in Psalm 8, they were crowned and surrounded by his presence, his glory. He came and fellowshiped with them in the cool of the day. There was this relationship. See, religion moves you away from relationship. And that's why there's no power in it eventually. And usually a curse and doctrines of devils, doctrines of men and all that, men and all that kind of thing. But in the garden, before sin came in, there was this environment of God all over them, in them, around them, through them. 
they sinned. When they sinned, they didn't just all of a sudden know they were physically naked. The reason they knew they were naked is because the garment left they were wearing. And the garment was the glory. The garment was God. And God had to pull back from them. Not because he was mad at them, because God is pure, perfect, and holy. And when sin enters his presence, it's immediately incinerated. So when they put themselves in a position to where his presence would kill them, he pulled back out of mercy. It'd be like you, all of a sudden, you knew if you hugged your child, you would kill them. It wasn't God, oh, you've done it now, I'm ticked off, I'm out of here. Now, that's the way people act. Not God. Now, I didn't say there wasn't an anger side to God, there is, but that's a whole different subject. But the point is this, is that God's presence, we need to read all the book of Acts. We get excited about Acts chapter 2. We get excited about, you know, uh, what happened uh, when uh, uh, Stephen went down to Samaria. We, or it's not Stephen, uh, um, Philip went down to Samaria. We get excited about things like that. But did you know there was something called Ananias and Sapphira in that? Where the glory was at such a level, the presence of God was on the church to such a level, that when they tried to penetrate that presence with sin, boom! Peter, a man who had great power and walked in love with Jesus. Jesus said, you're going to drink the same cup I've drunk. You're immature right now, Peter. You don't understand it. You're having to you know, start in your ministry. But the day's going to come when you're going to be able to lay your life down the way I laid my life down. You're going to come into that place of power and love. And he did. But yet he spoke words that caused those people to die. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. See, we don't know what we're asking for sometimes. I'm not saying be afraid of God. I'm not saying be like the children of Israel at Sinai when they saw shafts of light coming off of Moses' face because he'd been in the presence that they got scared and ran and said, put the veil over your face. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, don't do that. Don't veil the glory. Because you need the word and the spirit in order to walk in this thing. I just want to hear the word. I don't want none of that Holy Ghost stuff. Well, you're going to become legalistic, dead religion, Doctrines of men, doctrines of devils eventually, because you're not even fellowshipping with the author of the book enough to know what the book's about. The Bible says the Holy Ghost authored the book, and he is the teacher of the church. And he teaches us by precept and example. There's some things you learn by just going through them. Amen? So there's this element of all of this. You know, the Bible said that when... Noah listened to God and was warned of God and did the will of God in his life for 120 years. He brought judgment on the earth. See, you and I, that's, that's the other side of this two-edged sword we're using right now in our lives is we're not only bringing salvation to the earth, we're bringing judgment to the earth too. And we need to. God's a good God. He's going to show his salvation. He's going to demonstrate his goodness. He's going to put the invitation out there. The Bible says there will be no person that will stand before him on that day that will have an excuse. Amen? But the glory of God is not just a one-sided deal. Hallelujah. Now, where in the world do I go from here, Lord? Feed them, Lord. Ron said so. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's the word right there. See, what I'm, what I'm saying here is he is preparing us. He's trying to tweak our life over into a place of under... He's removing... See, there are things about us we don't see about us. You know, sometimes people know more about you than you do about yourself. Yeah, then sometimes they don't know anything about you they think they know about you. See, I may see you do something, but I don't know why you did it. I don't know the motive of your heart. 
It's like Kenneth Hagin years ago said, you know, he, he got in trouble for, he wasn't even really criticizing the guy. He just, a uh, pastor had done something immoral, and he, people asked him, did that happen? He said yes. Went to bed that night, and the whole room lit up with the glory of God in the dark, and God kept speaking to him audibly and asking him a question, which was a scripture, is a scripture. He kept asking him, who are you to judge another man's servant? We're God's servants, amen, his sons and his servants. And he, you know, he had to, okay, Lord, forgive me, you know, if that's what I did. So there's that element of not knowing people's hearts. That's why we don't judge their heart. And the Lord told him this in that experience. He said, for all you know, if you were under the same pressure he was in, you might have done worse than he did. Hallelujah. I've watched people over the years. I remember one person. This pastor had a moral failure. He criticized that pastor. He chewed him up, spit him out. He would say things like, my heart doesn't go out to him anymore. Oh, really? Well, you better be glad God's heart goes out to you still. All the goofball, dumb things you've done in your life. And he just kept saying that and saying that and saying that. You know what he did? Exactly the same thing that pastor did. He attached himself to the sin by continually sowing unforgiveness and criticism into that sin. And what you sow, God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. How many of you have prayed for Holy Ghost crop failures in some areas? That's called the mercy of God. Hallelujah. But this person I'm thinking of, he didn't do that. He didn't pray for that. He held fast to his stubbornness, and he ended up making the same error that that man made. He couldn't help himself. He was planting and growing a crop for years. And it showed up in his life. Was he saved? Yeah, I think he was. Born again? Yeah. Child of God? Yeah. But you know, you can be a child of God and do some stupid things. I know. I'm the case study for that. In my life. Amen. Amen. Now, is God merciful? Absolutely, his mercies and his grace is so much greater than what we can comprehend. But at the same time, understand this. Lord, don't let me get too far off into this and get messed up here. Everything in the spirit realm is legal. It's not legalistic. What we mean by legalistic is like the Pharisees. They had what God had told them through Moses, and then they... You know, God needed some help, so they threw in some other things. And they had their little box, their religious box, that you had to do this, 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 and this. And if you didn't, uh, you're out, buddy. And half of it wasn't even God. There was one sect of the Pharisees, you've probably heard me tell this before, but there was one sect of the Pharisees that were so hung up on the Sabbath day that they believed it was, it was actually a sin to spit on the, on the Sabbath day. Because if you spit on the Sabbath day, the spittle from your mouth worked with the dirt to form clay, and that was work. You were laboring on the day of rest. Do you see how ridiculous we can get? How crazy we can get religiously? Amen? Amen? So the Lord is greatly merciful, and he forgives us, and so forth. But he is a God who has found the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. So if I come to him after I know I'm supposed to forgive somebody and try to push that aside and do things my way and get him to make judgment calls for me as the king of the universe, it's not that he doesn't want to, it's that he's, he can't. His nature is holiness, which means he, he's pure, he's perfect. What he said, he's sovereign. But what he says, when he says something out of his sovereignty, it becomes truth forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So if I'm over here, and I'm trying to, you know, I want God to answer my prayer and do this for me and so forth, and I approach the throne of heaven, as the scripture says I can, in Hebrews 4, come boldly into the throne of grace to obtain mercy. But I'm coming in there, 
and I'm trying to break the law of love. The Bible says that all of the prophets and the law hang on or are supported by or stand by the love of God. The reason he said, thou shalt not murder, is love. And if I love you, I won't murder you. The reason he said, thou shalt not steal, is love. If I love you, I won't steal from you. And that's why it says, if we keep the law of love, we've got it all covered. There again, that doesn't mean we're going to be a perfect person, but what it means is our heart is right, and then when I go before God, if somebody's offended me or stolen from me or really injured me in some way, and maybe they're going all around town lying about me, and I'm hearing it because, you know, there's a lot of Christians that love to be the bearers of bad news. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pastor, 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 did you know what Sister Bucketmouth said about you? You know the best way to handle that? When you get people coming, they start gossiping about other Christians or about anyone, as far as that goes. When they, when they give you their, their, when they vomit on you, that's what that is, you know. Just reach out and take their hand and say, let's pray for them right now. And don't wait for them to say anything. Just start praying. You, that'll probably be the last time you'll, hear, you'll get any vomit on you from them. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. So the Lord, I, I, don't ask me what the title of this message is today. I have no clue. I thought we were in Luke 4, but that shows you how smart I am, right? I think God's just getting down to business today is what I think. See, I'm receiving this too, because I didn't think about this ahead of time. I didn't get up here and look across, oh, oh there's brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. They need to hear this today. I'm going to get them. I don't do that. That's prostituting the gospel. I'm not the Holy Ghost. Amen? How many of you are glad you're not the Holy Ghost? That's a big job. There is no Holy Ghost Junior. He's not twins. Amen? Praise God. And so, as we stay in that place of walking in the love of God, and it's not easy. This is so hard. Yeah, I know, but it's good. Why are we always looking for something easy? Because we're all lazy, that's why. To a certain extent, you know what I mean. It wasn't easy for Jesus to continue to love his own home synagogue when they tried to throw him off a cliff. It wasn't easy when he got accused of being born outside of wedlock. It wasn't easy. But he knew better than to step into the trap. At the end of his life, when he was getting ready to be crucified, and they were bringing him before Pilate and bringing him before Herod and all that, he said to his disciples, now listen, he said, I'm not going to speak with you much from this point on. And here's, he said, why? Because the prince of this world, who's that? The devil. The prince of this world is coming, or has come, and he has nothing in me to access me, to stop me from my mission, to keep me from doing what I'm here to do. And I'm not going to open my mouth under the pressure of what's going to be happening to me as a human and give him access. See, that's what the devil's doing. He's looking for access. He wants you to be mad at your aunt, the one that died five years ago and you're still mad at her. He wants you to stay, hang on to that. You don't know what they did to me. See, it's that, it's, it's really, it's rebellion. It's unforgiveness. It's <laughs> hard-heartedness, really, is what it is. And it's holding you in bondage. It's not hurting that other person. The devil legally has the right to step between you and God and sue you in the court of heaven and win. Because he knows what the law is. They're not operating in the law of love. I have the right to demand. Come on, are you here? Yeah. Some people think the test for maturity is how many dreams and visions somebody has or how, how, how their gifts that God's given them uh, operate uh, in them prophetically or whatever, gifts of healings or whatever. Those things are tools that are given to you to use to help others. 
in love. And the Bible tells us over in 1 Corinthians 14 that we are to follow after love and then desire those manifestations. Because those gifts without the motive of love, they become actually something that's going to hurt you. It's like a kid using a, a chainsaw that doesn't know what he's doing. It's a valuable tool unless you're using it in, the, with, uh, in maturity. The test for maturity, a mature Christian, is how much love are you walking in? How many of you believe God is mature spiritually? If, if you can say that about him. He's love. He's agape. You can't get any more mature than agape. Are you here? See, a lot of times we blame the, the devil for things, and it's really just us giving the enemy room to cut us off at the pass and keep us from receiving from heaven. What did Jesus say? When you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anybody. He didn't say put yourself on a guilt trip and think about everything you've ever done wrong in the past. He just said if there's a problem, and there again, you don't have to dig it up. The Holy Ghost will slap you in the face with it in a good way, and you'll say, thanks, I needed that. I remember here a while back, I told you this, I, I mentioned this recently. I was in the truck with my, two of my grandsons and both of my sons, and we're driving down, and we were talking about this one person, and we weren't attacking them. We weren't, you know, oh, that person's a no good so-and-so or whatever. We weren't doing that. We were just talking about some things that had happened that weren't good. Got home, went to bed, woke up the next morning, sat down with my cup of coffee and my Bible, and the first thing that came to me, as I just sat there and opened myself to the Lord. You know, I didn't hear you bless or pray for that person one time last night and all that talking you were doing about them. Yeah. yeah, that's what I said. Ouch. Thanks, I needed that. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right, Lord. I didn't. I wasted all those words and didn't bless that person one time, didn't pray for them or ask you to help them walk in the fullness of what you have for them. I repent in Jesus' name. And you know what he said next? Now I want you to call your sons and your grandsons and apologize to them for doing that. You know better than that. And you don't need to be giving them an example to live that way. Now you're going to find out if you're really humble. You've got to call your 18-year-old and 16-year-old grandson and apologize to him. Well, actually, I didn't call him. I texted him. I couldn't call them. They were in school. I didn't want to get, you know. And I just, I just explained it real quick in the text and said, forgive me. And they, you know, text me back. It's okay, Grandpa. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road right here. This can cause you to live in sickness and disease the rest of your life. Have you found Luke 4? I have too. Let's, let's leave that and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter... I'm going to wind this up here. Oh, I don't know, man. I got lots of time left. Oh, we have communion today? We do? Oh, this is the first Sunday, huh? Man, I hadn't even thought about that. No wonder the Lord's running down this little path right here. 1 Corinthians 11. You know, most of the preachers, you know, they kind of try to act like they know what they're talking about, but they really don't. I mean, I'm not saying they don't know the word or no doctrine or whatever. But when it comes to the prophetic voice of God speaking through us, we need to yield and let him do it. Years ago when he started cutting me off from notes and nine out of ten times wouldn't let me use notes, it scared the water out of me, man. Because I was dependent on my little notebook. See, I see even it's my security blanket. I have it with me this morning. But I, I've since found that the more I get out of his way, the more he can do. And if I'm up here thinking, oh, yeah, they need to hear this scripture. Oh, this is good right here. Oh, that's a good message. I'm going to preach that today. Oh, you are? God says, okay, do it without me. Because that's not my will. And all you're going to do is communicate some principles and things that are true to their head from your head. And nobody's going to get it here. You know... The disciples didn't understand everything Jesus said. They didn't get a lot of what he was saying. 
But when Jesus stood up and offended everybody on purpose by saying, all of you Jewish people, yeah, if you're going to be with me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And every Jew in that place or around him had been raised to know the one, one thing you do not do as a Jew is eat blood. But they didn't understand what he was saying. And he looked and they left, it says. And then Jesus looked at the 12 and he said, you guys going to leave too? Peter looked at him and he made one of the most brilliant statements he's ever made. He said, Lord, where do we go? Now listen, he said, you have the words of life. I don't get all of this stuff you're talking about, Jesus. All I know is that when you open your mouth and say something, something happens in me that causes life. We don't have to know it all. We just receive it. And God will explain it to us. 1 Corinthians 11, did you find it? Verse 17, I'm sure you've heard pastors preach on this for years. But you know, I found out that many times things that hang us up, keep us from moving forward, keep us from getting out of the bond. We were singing about the freedom today. That freedom's legally ours. But walking in it's a different story. Something can be legal yours, but not vitally yours. Amen? And when something's legally mine through the kingdom and the blood and, and the, uh, what Jesus did for me, and I'm not getting it in my life, I've learned to go to him and ask questions. Because he knows how to get me on the path I need to be on for it to be vitally mine. Sometimes there's a time element in it, but sometimes there's not. So here... Paul's giving them direction, verse 17. Now, in this I declare unto you, I praise you not. I don't even know when the pastor says, I praise you not, he's getting ready to say something. That you come together, not for the better, for the worse. He said, every time you guys gather together in church and together in fellowship, it, you don't, you don't, it's not good. <laughs> it says, you, you don't leave there better, you leave there worse. Isn't that what he's saying? He's saying when you guys come together, instead of you leaving with a blessing, you leave with a curse. Now, there's probably some person out there that, you know, doesn't want to go to church and saying, see, that's why I don't go to church, because bull, right? For first of all, when you come together in church, here's why he says, I hear that there are divisions among you. I hear that there are divisions among you. Jesus himself said, a house divided will what? <coughs> Fall. It will not stand. A human divided against themselves, that's why the devil always tries to divide you against yourself, or the body of Christ corporately divided against one another will not stand. That's why in America we have been a weak, anemic church over the last 40 years, and the enemy, through the spirit of Baal, has been able to come in and start influencing our universities, taking over things, to the point to where we were right near a cliff and God in his mercy jerked us back and now he's working to restore our nation to us if we'll have enough spiritual sense to understand it's not about a republic, it's not about a democrat. See, all that's going to do is further divide you. I got news for you. There are righteous people in both parties and there are demonized people in both parties. God's had my wife for the last five years praying, there is nothing hidden but that it shall come to light. God is jerking the covers off of things, and people that are operating with the devil are screaming like a mashed cat. Because God is going to reveal the truth. And that truth will set you free if you receive the truth. But in other cases, people that don't want to live in truth, it's going to be bad. It's true. And I'm not, there again, it's not about, I mean, there's certain people God's using in certain ways. That's his business. But see, I, I even, I'm, it's, Lord, <laughs> show me where I'm, yeah. where, I, where I'm, you know, thinking something that's not really lined up. Yeah. Yeah. My wife here, I'm sure she won't mind if I, I think I've already shared this publicly. <laughs> Probably when she wasn't in the room, you know. The Lord spoke to her something here the other day and showed her certain things and she made some adjustments and God told her right after that, you just added 10 years to your life. 
Now, I believe that. You know why? Because I remember many years ago when I first accepted the call to ministry, I was working with a Christian man, and he left his wife and went and, mar- and hung out with another woman that he eventually married and all this. And I was driving out to his house, and I was feeling sad because I loved him and his family, and I didn't want to see that happen. And I heard the voice of the Lord tell me, he just shortened his life. And, it, you know, I thought, what? Oh, I don't know. I wonder if that was just my man. You know, you how you are about stuff like that. Ten years later, he was dead in a head-on collision at a very young age. I don't even think he was 50, was he? Maybe, around 50. This is not games. The devil's playing for keepsies here. And so is God. So Paul is speaking to these folks, and he's saying, no, you can't. He says, I'm telling you, you guys are actually, it's hurting you to get together. Not helping you. Because you're dividing yourself uh, against each other. And he says, I partly believe it. Even Paul wasn't dumb enough to be sucked into all the rumors. He believed part of it. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are, are approved may be made manifest among you. A heresy is someone who does their own thing. They, they develop their own little uh, religious box of teaching the way they see things. They think they have the gift of immaculate perception. The way I see it is the way it is. One of the biggest mistakes some preachers make is they don't listen to other preachers. I'm thankful for other ministers. Even some that don't believe certain things the way I believe them. I listen to them because I've learned things from them. I don't, I, you know, you learn to eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Amen. You don't just accept anything. You, you take it to the word and so forth. But we need to understand that we need to honor one another. Jesus said, the way you treat somebody else is the way you're treating him. Would you gossip about Jesus? Would you hold unforgiveness against Jesus? When you do it with your brother and sister, you are. He takes it personally. When he confronted Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and spoke to him, he said, why are you persecuting me? And he, Paul was doing that, or Saul was doing that to the church. Jesus was in heaven. He couldn't persecute him directly. But that's how the Lord sees it. See, we are members one of another. Christian cannibalism is crazy. If I start chewing on you with criticism and gossip and unforgiveness, it's like me gnawing on my own arm trying to gnaw it off. Boy, I didn't plan on preaching any of this this morning. <laughs> So a heresy is somebody who they, they usually have their own little idea. You know, they're in pride. You usually hear them say things like this, and I've had this happen to me over the years. They come to the church. I don't even know who they are yet. You know, new, new person or something. Uh, is there room for my ministry in this church? I don't know. I don't know what your ministry. I don't even know. For all I know, you're a demon. I mean, I don't tell them that, but that's true. That's true, right? You may be an angel of light for all I know. But I'll tell you what there is room for in in this church for you. There's room for your servanthood. There's room for your humility. There's room for your love. And when you prove yourself and people can actually trust you, there might be room for your ministry. But beware of people that are always looking for authority. Or they're trying to take authority over you. You need to come over here. You need to get away from that church. Come over to my Bible study. That's usually minor prophets prophesying minor things or messed up things. I'm not saying you can't have a Bible study. If God tells you to, have one. But make sure it's the right kind. Make sure it's submitted to God, submitted to love. And I I would be looking for who else God wants me to submit to. I got to get going here. For there must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, God says, you know, God's going to use this process to show who's really, whose heart's not really right. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He says, don't fool yourself. You're over here thinking you have communion, but you're not. You're just putting something in your belly. It's not affecting you in a good way spiritually at all. As a matter of fact, it's affecting you in a negative way. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. Now, see, back in those days, they used to actually have a covenant meal like Jesus had with his disciples. You know, we today have the little cracker and we have the juice 
and all that kind of thing, which it's not about how much food you eat or what kind of format you have. It's about what you're doing in the spirit. You're honoring his body and blood. And in his brokenness is our wholeness. He bought, that's why when we take that, it's not let's have Jesus' funeral service again. It's we honor the fact that you paid such a tremendous price. Your brokenness brought complete wholeness to us. And that's why it's such a sorrowful thing for us to not live in the unity of that wholeness of love when he provided it for us to bless us, to bring all the covenant blessings to us, and to protect us from the enemy. Hallelujah. So he says, For in eating everyone taketh, verse 21, before the other his own supper, and one is hungry and the other is drunken. What he's saying is, you're doing this in, in selfishness. You're partying, man. You're getting drunk. You're over here elbowing your way through the line. Get out of my way. I want my food. Now, those, those may sound like, you know, well, what? they're getting in line in front. Of, it's not that. It's what's in here. It's that attitude. We eat this broken bread and we drink this blood to remember that now we can be in unity and should walk in wholeness and love because that's the place of blessing in the covenant. Amen? What? Paul says, what? Verse 22. Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto, also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. My body. What's he saying to him? I'm getting ready. You, you've seen me in, in wholeness. You've seen me in perfection. You've never seen the devil be able to, uh, you know, somehow overcome me in any way. He had touched every kind of contagious disease there was in praying for people. He had had the, the PhDs come and try to catch him in his own words and corner him. He'd had it all. They'd seen it all. But he was saying to them, I'm getting ready to let the enemy break in on me. Let the spirit of murder come in here. I'm getting ready to spill the life, the, the DNA of God that's running through my veins. I'm getting ready to pour it out. I'm going to be that sacrifice, that curse. Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. I'm going to receive the curse that's on you that's going to keep you separated from God, keep you broken and separate. I'm receiving that on me. I'm going to let it happen to me so that you can be one and whole and dwell in the kingdom of his love. How dare you not treat other people right? I tell you what, I sense the presence of God so strong right now. Now, do we get upset at times and say things we shouldn't? Absolutely. I'm so thankful for the ministry of repentance. <laughs> but see, some Christians don't repent. I'm sorry. We don't hear, need to hear you're sorry. We need you to repent. Repentance means change the way you're thinking and the direction you're going. Amen? Amen. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, did I read? Oh, I was reading verse 22, wasn't I? Jumped ahead of myself there. Verse 23, I'm sorry. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do as a memorial to me. That word remembrance means memorial. What is a memorial? We have memorials all around town over here at the park. We have memorials to the different wars. We have memorials to fallen police officers and things like that. What, what are those for? Are those so we can just drive by and go, oh, that's nice? No. We're to look at that and say, you know what? In history, in time, that man 
gave his life or that woman gave their life. They spilled their blood. Their body was broken so I can live in freedom. And I need to remember that and do what I need to do to protect what they did for me so I can still live in that freedom. That freedom we were singing about. Jesus said, I want you to recall what I did for you and live in the freedom. But you can only live in the freedom when you understand the motivation behind it and live in that motivation. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took a cup when he'd supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance, once again, is a memorial to me. And I don't have time to get into all that and talk about it. But look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do demonstrate. That's what that word show means. The Lord's death till he comes. See, what we are doing when we receive communion, we are, we are in faith. We're adding works to our faith, and we're saying, Jesus did this for me, therefore I honor him today, and I receive all that he has for me, but I also submit myself to the same motivation that he did this for me. I'm going to do the same for other people. I'm going to live in this love. I'm going to honor that greatest act of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. Amen? And I'm going to not just try to receive the benefits of it. I'm going to walk in the love that he walked in to make it available. You see, it's only made available in that love. It's illegal to have it without that love. That's why when we walk in unforgiveness, the devil walks into the court of heaven and goes, nope, wait, uh-uh. And God says, you're right, what can I say? For as often as you do eat this bread and drink this cup, you do demonstrate the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, because of what he just explained here, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, how do you do that? You try to do it outside of love. You try to do it with unforgiveness in your heart. You try to do it with selfishness in your, you know, in some kind of attitude towards somebody else in the body of Christ. You don't, you don't, uh, you know, submit yourself to love and, and, and walk in unity with people. And, you know, well, if so-and-so jumps in line in front of me, I'm just going to forgive them and, and bless them. And when I think about that person that's gossiping about me, I'm not going to join the gossip game. The Bible says that when someone curses us, we are not to render cursing for cursing, but contrary-wise blessing, knowing that we are to receive a blessing. You got one person cursing, the other one cursing, what do you got? You got a crop of cursing going both ways. You got one person cursing, and you're rendering blessing instead. You're sowing blessing, you will reap blessing. But you have to do that in love. Hallelujah. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the, the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So you put yourself in with those that killed him. I know this is kind of hard to wrap your head around. But it is in the Bible, isn't it? How can God exonerate me when I'm standing guilty? Verse 28, but let a person, let a man examine himself, not examine his neighbor. Look at that guy over there taking communion. I saw him last week, and I know that he was drunk. I know that he did this, and I know he did that. Really? Well, what do you know about between last week and now? How do you know he didn't repent? How do you know that he you know, hasn't had a major life change in his heart? You let God be the judge of other people. You judge yourself. You discern your own heart. Am I walking in love? I'm responsible for me walking in love. I'm not responsible for you walking in love. Amen? Where am I at here? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup, once you've examined yourself. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Why? He's not discerning the Lord's body. He's not discerning what this is all about. He's not discerning the real bottom line with all of this. 
Are you here? There's two ways, basically, that you, you, you have to discern the Lord's body. Number one, you discern what he did with his body for you. You discern by his stripes you're healed. You discern that his mind was so tormented, like it says in Isaiah 53, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He said, I'm so full of, uh, of sorrow, I'm about to die. And Jesus never exaggerated. Jesus never, uh, you know, just told something. He, he meant it when he said, My, I'm sweating blood here, I'm about to die. He was, you talk about depressed, you ain't never been depressed as he was that day. And had emotional pressure on you. He, so we discerned the body, we discerned. There were, you know, eight, eight things, seven things that times that he bled, and each one of them paid for something else in our life. We discern that about the Lord's body. But we also discern that, as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, we are a member corporately of a corporate body. And I need to treat the members of the body as I would treat me. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not do unto others before they do to you. Amen? The great truth of, of a body is it's interdependent upon itself. My hand cannot say to my heart, I don't need you. Let's rip the heart out. The hand will die. You need me whether you like it or not. I need you whether I like it or not. And when I realize that I need you, I like it. Because I need you. We need one another. Amen? Praise God. He that eateth and, wor- uh, eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, for this cause... Not because they don't have enough faith or they don't believe enough. Jesus said, man, all you got to have is a seed. And it don't even have to be a big seed. It's just a little old mustard seed size. But a seed has the ability to reproduce itself. It's not about the faith. I mean, you need to have faith. You need to understand to use faith. But it's not about that, Paul says. It's about your heart attitude toward yourself and toward others and toward Jesus. And so if you don't deal with that, all you're doing is going through some religious game. You've got yourself self-deceived. The devil is slowly taking you into his fate for your life. See, there's two plans for your life. There's the destiny of God and there's the fate of the enemy. When I was 29 years old, I sat in my work truck. Jesus was talking to me and he showed me I was at a fork in the road. And that day I had to decide, am I going to go into the fate of the devil or am I going to go into the destiny of God that he had for me and was talking to me about 16 years old? And that's what this is saying. It ain't about what side of the tracks you're born in, on. It ain't about what color your skin is or isn't. It ain't about your level of income. All the things people have made it about. Listen, you and God together are a majority. There's no demon, there's no politician, there's no person that can keep you from all God has for you spiritually and naturally if you team up with him and you do it his way. Are you here? He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. For this cause many are weak, sickly, and many sleep, or many are dead prematurely. Christians. Many are weak, just limping along. And there again, now, I'm not, don't just think of this in terms of some kind of physical situation. Because you can be as strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger was when he was young. Physically and be a Barney Fife spiritually. (laughs) Come on, you know what I'm saying? Some of us still remember Barney. It's true. Or you can be Barney on the outside and Arnold on the inside. The Bible says be strong in the Lord. Well, who's the Lord? He's the Spirit. Be spiritually strong, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, pursuing that relationship with God. Amen? So he's not just talking about necessarily physical, although he is talking about that as well. It says, many are weak and sickly, and many of you are prematurely dead. Verse 31, for if you would judge yourselves, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
But when we are judged, if we have to be, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. In 2 Corinthians, they wrote to Paul and they said, hey, we got a guy in the church that's having relations that he shouldn't have with his mother-in-law. And he won't repent. Paul wrote him back and said, I've already judged on this matter. He said, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That, he said, his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. What was Paul saying? He was saying, this man's on a pathway where eventually he's going to lose his salvation if he keeps going. So it would be better that we open the door and let the devil kill him physically and his spirit go to heaven than for him to lose his salvation forever. That's in the Bible. I remember a story, true story about a church. This guy, he kept giving problems and causing trouble in the church and doing things he shouldn't be doing. And the pastor finally just one day said, uh, went to him and said, uh, we're turning you over to Satan. We're going to meet you tomorrow night. We're going to turn you over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. What? Showed it to him in the Bible. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. Don't do that. Don't do that. He got pretty serious about things. Now, I've never done that. I've never had the Lord tell me to do that. But there again, there is. There is see, this is not just playing games. He says here that the Lord, if we keep on, if we keep pushing the envelope, if we just keep doing what we're doing, he'll be brought to a place where he'll say, I, I, have, to, I have to judge you, I have to chasten you in this, because you won't stray. And a lot of times, too, it's because if they stay alive, they're going to mess things up for a whole lot of other people. That's why you see a lot of preachers get judged quickly. The Bible says don't push in or rush in to be a teacher or be a rabbi or be a, you know, one in authority. Because it says you're going to get the greater judgment. See, what I say up here affects more than just me and my wife and my kids. And it's online. It's going out across the nation or across the world. So if I get up here and I get in some kind of pride and I start belching out a bunch of unbelief and garbage and I have a wrong heart and I'm not walking in love and I'm not doing what God tells me to do the way he tells me to do it and with the heart I should do it with, then he's going to come to me and say, hey, you're hurting my people. And you need to repent. And he's going to give me room to repent. I mean, if he gave Jezebel room to repent, he'll give Pastor John room to repent. Amen? But if I don't do it, eventually he's going to judge me, and he'll take me out if he has to, just like Ananias and Sapphira. Well, I didn't know God would do that. Paul says, knowing the goodness and the severity of God. Now, God, even, even in that man being judged, that was love. I don't want to see him eternally damned. I don't want to see him in the lake of fire, gnawing on his tongue and screaming for eternity. So it's better that he die now. Sometimes that explains things we don't understand. And I'm not saying we can make a judgment call on that all the time. But I am saying this. God loves you. But he expects you to love others. He expects you to walk in love. There is no excuse. You can play it off, pawn it off, excuse it away. Now, let me just say this in closing. Man, I was trying to close a half hour ago. <laughs> let me say this in closing. And I don't have time, of course, to get on, on into this, but we are in a day and in a season and in an hour where things are shifting and changing quickly. God's moving ahead. He's taking us into this culmination of all things. Now, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, and neither does your favorite prophecy preacher. If they try to tell you that, turn it off right there, because the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. But it doesn't say we wouldn't know the time or season. And we are definitely in the time and season. Now, I don't know if I'll be around here. I may be dead and gone. My great-grandchildren may be here. Great-great-grandchildren may be here. when he. I don't know. It could happen quick, or it could happen a long time. We don't know. We just don't. But what we do know is, and I do know from my studying and my time with him, especially since about 2008, as he began to show me certain things, we are rolling over into a kingdom age emphasis. You know, when you have summer and you have winter, there's a season in between called spring, where you have a little winter and you have a little summer. 
We are in a time like that right now. We are experiencing things that have been in the kingdom, but we're also, he's, he's wanting to bring us into things that will be. Yes. He's wanting to show us things. See, he, he says, I'm going to do exceeding abundantly beyond what you can even ask or think. There are things you haven't understood yet. There are things you haven't seen. So he's trying to progressively bring us into things. And part of that is we have to be in a position to be able to receive the revelation and walk in it. And so this right here is vitally important. One thing I've noticed over the years of my life is that when we come to a time where there's like a spiritual seasonal shift, a lot of people die. A lot of people die. And I don't think it's because, you know, God says, well, that's it. I'll shoot you. You know, he's not... It's that, it's that they're, they're not going to go on into this season. And it would actually be better that they come home if they're not going to be able to do that. But then there are other people that come alive. They, they move into things that they've never moved in before. And we're in a time, without getting into it, you know, going on into it, we're in a time like that right now. Don't Whatever you do, do not allow your heart to be polluted. We're kind of full circle of what we are talking about at the beginning of the service. Don't allow the stream. See, the Bible says uh, things will flow out of your innermost being, the Bible says in Proverbs. Yes, and Jesus talked about rivers of living water. But you see, you can pollute the water with unforgiveness or these pride and these things we're talking about. Don't let your springs of water be polluted. Because if you keep that water clear, you're going to be clear. You're going to understand. You're going to move into. God has got things for you that you don't even comprehend or understand right now. And you don't have to right now. All you have to do is listen and move into it. So let's receive communion today. Go ahead, ushers, and just uh, serve the people. Now, if you're here today... And you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right now is a good time to do it. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know you're my Savior. You've been sent to save me from my sins. I give you my life. I give you my life. And when you give him your life, he'll give you his life. His eternal life. It's that simple. If you've never done that, do it right now, right where you're sitting. If you're here and you are a Christian, and maybe in the message I preached today that I didn't know I was going to preach, Luke 4 was really good, wasn't it? Luke 4 was just wonderful. We, if there was something that just quickened in your heart, God's not picking on you. Listen to me. He's not picking on you. He's not beating on you. He's not, you know, trying to hurt you. He's not trying to condemn you. That's the devil. He's a liar. There's no truth in him. But God loves you enough. If there's a spiritual cancer cell growing in your spirit, God doesn't want you to get to the fourth stage before he gets rid of it. He doesn't want you to wait till it's killing you. He wants to point it out and pluck it out and cut it out with his sword of the spirit. And so if that's the case, just open your heart. Don't try to dig up bones. Don't try to dig up things in the past that are dead and buried and gone, under the blood, dealt with. But right on the other hand, yeah, and this just came to me. There's somebody here, God's really been speaking to you strong about what he wants you to do. And it's, a, it's ministry. Now, we, don't, we think of ministry of what I'm doing up here. Well, that's ministry, but that's not all there is to ministry. Sometimes you going around, ministry could be you picking up trash because God told you to. I mean, he shouldn't even have to tell you to. If you drop it, pick it up. Amen? But we think ministry, you know, we, we, we have ministry in this like holy sepulcher thing, you know. And, but ministry is you being who God made you to be. And he may tell you, I want you to go and volunteer, you know, with, with Pam and the group over at the elementary school and teach the kids the Bible after school. Or he may tell you, I want you to go over here and, uh, and volunteer to help give the yard 
person a break so they can go have lunch instead of stand out there in the sun with that whistle and you just give them a break. You serve them in love. There's a thousand different ways God could send you and have you do. Now, people are wanting God to do for them, but they're not doing what God wants them to do in his kingdom. Your blessing is in your obedience. I'm telling you, everything you'll ever need naturally or spiritually is in the will, the plan, and the purpose of God in your life. If you just follow that, you'll walk right into the favor of God. You'll walk right into the provision of God. I'm t- it's not something I learned in a book. I've experienced it. But this, this is a word for somebody here, maybe more than one somebody. God's been prompting you. Now, when I say prompting, it just keeps coming up in you. You know one thing I've found about God is he'll bug you. Thank God. He's consistent. He'll prompt you in your heart. There's just, this, just these thoughts that come up into you. I, I need to go do that. I don't want to do that. I don't have time to do that. Plus, it's going to cost me gas money to do that. I don't have the extra gas money. The devil will come up with a gazillion reasons why you can't obey God. But God will take care. Where God guides, he provides. Amen. Don't ever forget that. Just go along for the ride, because where God guides, he provides. And sometimes one simple step of obedience is all the step you need to take to break through into a, a whole new open realm of God where things start connecting together for you. I mean, I could stand here for hours and days and tell you in my life about things that when God's told me to do something didn't make sense in my head. It was something that I didn't even really want to do or it didn't seem to me like I should do it anyway. And I, but yet in obeying that, all of these things begin to connect and happen. And I'm sure glad I did it. So there's somebody here today. If the Lord's prompting you, just follow his promptings. Amen. Well, Father, we give you praise this morning. Lord, I love it. We go to our doctors at least once a year usually, and he checks our heart. You're, you're just giving us a heart checkup today. Motivations of our heart. We're so thankful that We don't have to be concerned about our missteps and our faults and our failures and our slips and our sins. You've you've forgiven us. Just as we forgive our children for being human, you forgive us. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Every one of us in this room, there's more to be thankful for than there is to complain about. And so with a spirit of thanksgiving, Father... We come before you right now. And most importantly, we're thankful for that body and that blood. The enemy can argue, he can fight, he can try to deceive, but he cannot do anything about what defeated him once and for all. That great sacrifice of the body and blood of the Lord. In his brokenness, we have wholeness. So we choose to walk in that wholeness of love with one another. I make a decision today to forgive and release anyone at any time that ever has or ever will do something to me or say something to me or be something to me that's not love. I ask you to forgive them and I forgive them. I choose to forgive them. And not only that, I bless them in Jesus' name. I say, Father, I thank you for leading them into the path you have for them. I thank you for showing them your pathway. And your word says that we're to bless those that curse us. So God, from now on, every time I think about them, I'm going to bless them on purpose. I'm going to pray for them, the word tells me to. And so devil, if you want them getting a lot of prayer, you just keep bringing the issue up and I'll keep praying for them. You can provide the prayer request and I'll pray it. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. We choose this day to receive wholeness from your brokenness. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, as we take the body today, this which is symbolic of your body, we receive all that your body provided for us and all that your corporate body, through the gifts and anointings of the Holy Spirit in and upon the people that are in your body, provide for us today. We honor your body. We honor our brothers and sisters. We honor ourselves because we are part of that body. 
And we receive all that your broken body has provided for us. Help us to minister that same thing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. You may receive the body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your blood. In you was life, and the life was the light of men. We thank you that your blood there in heaven, according to Hebrews 12, is speaking to the Father on our behalf. Speaking from the mercy seat, the mercy that is ours through your blood. We thank you. We receive the mercy and we give the mercy. We give mercy. We give mercy to other people. We forgive them. We're not going to live in self-pity. We're not going to live in some kind of childish, immature attitude. We choose to release them. Help us to mature in love. Help us to grow, Lord. Help us to come into that place where that river of love flows through us. We thank you for your blood. We know the bloodline, the covenant, is something the enemy cannot violate, and he cannot cross the bloodline. And so we draw the bloodline around our family. We draw it around everything you've given us to rule and reign over in this life. Everything you've given us to be a part of, Father. Our body of Christ, our church, our job, we draw the bloodline in Jesus' name. And we say to you, Satan, you will not approach the bloodline in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, we receive the life that's in your blood in Jesus' name. Amen. You may receive it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now just give him praise for what he's done for you. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Lord. We receive healing. We receive forgiveness. We receive the blessings of God. We receive the angels going out. Going out and doing that which you have sent them to do on our behalf. Make us a blessing, Lord. Make us a blessing. Make us a blessing to people, Lord. In these days where you are shifting things and aligning things, we thank you for it. We set ourselves to obey you and to do what you've called us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, before we leave, we want to receive our, we call it our harvest offering, storehouse offering, we used to call it. And uh, this is to help people who have practical needs. Sometimes they need gas in their car. Sometimes, you know, baby diapers or we do use a a part of this too because we give out around 30 boxes of food on Thursday through the food ministry. We uh, use some of this money to uh, help pay for that as we distribute them in connection with the food bank. They take phone calls and they line up a, a list of people that have need for this food and they send them to us and our food. Everybody that's in the food ministry that's here this morning, you guys stand up. Food ministry folks, just stand up. Amen. Give them a hand. Tell him to stand up. He needs to stand up. Tell him to stand up too. Stand up. You're part of that. Praise God. Amen. CJ, back in the back, he helps. Over here, yes, these folks show up every Thursday at 9, 8, 8 in the morning, and then about 9.15, pastor usually rolls in, or somebody does with food, <laughs> and uh, it's, they unload it into the, the front room there. They you know, separate it, and a lot of times that's a pretty big job, just getting it all separated out. And then at about 10 o'clock, people start coming in, and they, they uh, give them the food. We also have clothes uh, that we distribute as well. And they, they serve and minister to the community. And they also, they open their heart to God and ask him to use them. And they've prayed for people. People have been healed. People have been blessed and encouraged and helped. So it's a tremendous uh, ministry that maybe you're not around here because it happens on Thursday mornings. But these folks are a great blessing to our community through the food ministry. Amen. Real quick. And this Thursday, we're having a special guest speaker, uh, um, former uh, city of Madera uh, mayor and uh, current supervisor for District 3, Rob Poitras, is going to be joining us this Thursday. Um, if you guys have any questions on how to uh, get access to the live stream, just uh, go ahead and ask me or Ron, raise your hand. Yeah, there you go. Right there, you can yeah, every Thursday you. morning, Ron and CJ do fire, they call it fire starters. It starts at what time? Uh, 10.30. 10.30. 
It's online? Yes. You want to get on Facebook or? Yeah, you can uh, just search uh, on Facebook, you just search fire starters in the morning. And then and so it's a live show and they have different guests come in and share. And uh, so if you want to tap into that, that's uh, a blessing. It's a good thing to Yes, sir. You can also go on YouTube and look at past recordings. Yeah. We'll go on YouTube. YouTube, fire starters in the morning? Fire yes. starters in the morning. Yeah. And you can watch the past shows that have been on there. We know somebody that needs to hear something that said it to them. You can share it. Amen. It's been a great blessing. And you can subscribe and like us too. Yeah. Yeah, I like them. I like them. No, I like them. They gotta like it. They gotta like it. That's right. Great. Now let's stand. Hallelujah. Mike's gonna be ministering tonight. They're on the fireworks stand right now. If your neighbors are buying fireworks, send them over to our stand. All that money goes to help the kids in the children's ministry, to help for camp and help for other things. So uh, it's a big fundraiser we do every year to help uh, pay for some of that. So it's at the corner of Cleveland and D. If you have an opportunity, go on over there. Or you can just show up at Harold's and have fireworks on <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I think I already lives. They don't let fireworks happen. Right. Amen. Well, Father, thank you. Thank you, Father. What a bright future we have in you. Lord, you've brought us to a place, and I know we're moving into some things, God, that we've all been praying for for years and standing for. And Lord, you've uh, been faithful to get us where we need to go. So I thank you. I bless the people now in Jesus' name. Thank you for blessing their families and all that they're about, Lord, in their lives, spirit, soul, body, socially, financially, in Jesus' name. Thank you for all that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Get some sleep. Take a holy ghost.